I'm Lawrence Francis, host of Interpreting Wine, the place to learn from thought leaders in the world of wine and marketing, welcoming you back to the Wine Growers British Columbia series, a specially commissioned two-part series recorded at Taste Canada 2022 annual tasting in London, exploring the North and South Okanagan Valleys in the company of the people who live and make wine in the region. We kick off this second episode with a North Okanagan Valley regional overview with Christine Coletta of Okanagan Crushpad. She orientates us to the culture, geography and geology of this region before focusing in on her international team and tasting a couple of their wines. Following which, each winery representative introduces us to their estate and tastes one of the wines they brought to Canada House you can, as ever, find below details of all wineries, wines tasted, and as appropriate, their UK importer or whether they're seeking representation. Enjoy. My name is Christine Coletta. Along with my husband, Steve, we own Okanagan Crush Pad Winery in Summerland, British Columbia. We've been in the wine business since 2005, coming from different careers. And this was to be a retirement project that went very, very, very wrong because I can't see myself ever stopping what we're doing right now. We opened our winery in 2011, and uh, it's just been such an amazing experience for us. We, we, we love being in the business. Uh, every day is a different challenge, and uh, we're just thrilled to be here. We have a winemaker from New Zealand, Matt Dumain. He's been with us since 2013, and our director of viticulture is also from New Zealand. His name is Duncan Billing, and we've recently hired a CEO, Daryl Brooker, who's an Australian who spent time in New Zealand, so he can understand the two Kiwis that we have. Uh, the, the winery is about 35,000 cases. We are organic certified, and our vineyards are all organic certified. I think that you'll find more and more uh, organic certification coming to the Okanagan Valley. Uh, we have an area where um, we have very low pest impacts and we can do organics quite easily. Uh, it's a little overwhelming to begin the process. Um, our consulting winemaker Alberto Antonini likes to say that um, you know, you've been eating fast food junk and then you go on a lean <laughs> cuisine diet and you're going to change. So the vines we find go through a bit of a shock, culture shock, when they convert from conventional farming to organic. But then they bounce back a few years later with incredible health and vigor and uh, just beautiful. We love working with organic fruit. Uh, we find that we can get phenolic ripeness uh, earlier at lower alcohols um, are the result of the wines that we make. So it's been, um, it's been an interesting journey for us, but now having been working with organic farming since 2011, um, we certainly have a really strong path forward. We have 320 acres of land, uh, about 70 acres of organic grapes. We have an organic vegetable garden and a lavender farm as well. So it's a beautiful spot in the middle of the Okanagan. As you've probably heard from other people that you've been talking to, uh, our winemaking community really has diverse backgrounds. We're really fortunate. We have people who were trained in France, California, New Zealand, Germany, uh, and they really add um, a richness to what we're doing. Uh, there's no set formula. We're new wine country. We're new territory. And uh, people are really trying to find their way with a new style. I think collectively, we're all striving to make Okanagan wine the very best we can, rather than emulating or copying what's being done in other regions. And uh, we're now, as an industry, probably about 35 years old. And we've gained a little bit of confidence in, in order to be able to strike out and find our own style, which is happening all up and down the valley. Uh, there's a very unique style in the north. Uh, the temperatures are cooler than they are in the south. We get a little more rain, and the varieties that we grow there are predominantly Pinot Noir, Gamay, 
Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, and then the aromatics uh, with the Gewurztraminer and Riesling, and even some delightful Ehrenfelser, Pinot Oxawa. There's uh, a lot of different varieties that are grown in the Okanagan. I'm sure you've heard that from other people. We have a hard time sort of pinning down what we do best, and I think what we've decided is what we do best is diversity, which is really not saying much, but there's uh, there's a style that emerges from our region, and it's not necessarily tied to uh, a grape variety. It's uh, more stylistic, if you would, cool climate, lower alcohol, uh, less manipulation of wine, uh, just a sort of a pureness and a liveliness and a, a fresh juiciness to the wines that I think is our is our calling card. The geography in the Okanagan is really interesting. When you get to my area and north, uh, there's there was a lot of volcanic movement and action, uh, especially around the lake. Uh, you'll see some very, very dramatic uh, cliffs and bluffs with vineyards perched on either side of the lake. It is a spectacularly beautiful region. Um, it makes it really takes your breath away when you when you fly in and you fly over it. Um, it's just really enchanting. I think that's probably the best word. It still takes my breath away, and I've been going to the region since I was a young child. The um, soils are very different. You can get some heavy gravel, uh, limestone. Then you get clay sand in other areas. Uh, we have one vineyard that we're constantly picking rocks, and they just seem to, it just seems to grow rocks every time you turn around. We have tons of erratics, which are large boulders that have been placed there by volcanic action and the whole property is peppered with them. Uh, you work around them, you don't move them. Yet on other vineyards that we have, there's not a rock to be found. It's all sandy clay. Uh, a lot of the limestone in the area is in the form of powder. So it's, uh, it's very fine and it's integrated in with the sand and clay. I think the, the key thing for us is that we are really one of the only desert areas in Canada and it, it really uh, people are really really surprised uh, at how hot it gets there we have a super intense growing season it turns on overnight and it it's sharply ends at the end of the season um, you've really got to sort of push the limits of, of what's possible in order to um, grow beautiful grapes in the Okanagan uh, we like to say that um, we're on the fringe of what's possible in the wine-growing world, um, being as far north as we are. It doesn't necessarily hold that the growing season is shorter in the north than the south. Um, you'll get an, you can get an extreme uh, cold snap in the south, um, and it's very region by region. So this year, in, for example, there was a fair bit of winter damage, it didn't happen in the middle of the Okanagan. It happened in the south in areas, and it happened in the north, but in very specific places. So there's really no one straight answer to, um, uh, you know, territory by territory. It seems to change dramatically uh, vintage to vintage. You can go 50 feet, and the terroir is completely different than it was uh, where you were a moment ago. We've, uh, on our big property, we dug... 100 pits, uh, and what we found in each pit was varied from top of the vineyard to the bottom, incredibly varied. You'll get an area where you have that's gravel, um, just pure gravel, and then you have another area where you've got um, sort of a lot of limestone and uh, big, bigger boulders that are mixed in. With uh, and then you know down down the slope a bit, uh, it's sandy loam, mm-hmm. and it's all covered by native uh, plants: uh, sage, bunch grass, cactus. So it's a really interesting territory. I, I don't know very many places in the world where you find cactus and snow. It's a wildly beautiful place. It's. Uh, um, yeah, it's some, it's some of the winemakers that have come to, to work there uh, from around the world are just blown away by 
it's our winemaker likes to say it's like New Zealand on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a Kiwi. He's a Kiwi, so he can say it. And so it's it's you know it's rougher, it's yeah. more extreme. It's uh, you know they come they come to Canada, they have something to prove there. They really feel that they you know they're they're they really have something to prove. They have to battle the elements in order to to make wine. When it comes to viticulture. There's two sort of approaches. There's conventional farming, and then there's a growing group of people who are committed to organic and sustainability. We actually have a sustainable wine growing uh, program that was introduced over, about a year ago. A lot of the wineries have subscribed to that. I think that's a really good first step, in my opinion, towards organic and uh, moving forward. We have such a beautiful place. The less we can do to harm it, the less we can do to change it, is, uh, I believe, really important. The Okanagan is a really interesting territory because back in the 40s, it was carved into 10-acre parcels. And so people were given a 10-acre parcel as an incentive to become a farmer, move their families out. Um, A lot of returning um, vets from the war uh, went on to try and plant uh, originally watermelons, cantaloupes, mm-hmm. and later tree fruits. So our history is that a lot of the sites in the Okanagan are small 10-acre sites. Some of those have been put together to create bigger properties. Mm-hmm. But the challenge you have with that is that you've got your neighbor impacting your farming decisions. So I think it's quite interesting to see that more and more people are becoming aware of their use of chemicals in terms of farming. And uh, I think as a whole, the Okanagan uh, is a, a place where you can grow grapes um, without any very many inputs in terms of what you're, what you're doing to control weed and uh, pests. The biggest impact on uh, variety is, is weather. So the, the duration of the harvest uh, will dictate, um, and the heat units will dictate what you have planted. Uh, as I said earlier, there's Pinot Noir and Gamay. Uh, there's a few brave individuals that have other uh, red varieties planted, but they're very specifically in a very hot um, little site in a small microclimate. So it could be Syrah, but it's up against a, a you know a, a, a mountain, you know, with rock background. Um, so there's a lot of uh, little tiny microclimates throughout the valley. But predominantly, um, people's approach to viticulture is really dictated, to by the, the weather conditions in the area. Uh, Pinot Gris is, does spectacularly well, Pinot Blanc, Chardonnay, uh, and the aromatics. And um, people will are now beginning to understand that clone... Uh, site orientation, uh, irrigation systems and, you know, programs and all of those things need to be really dialed in. I think we came from a place where everything was planted the same way, same orientation, same rootstock, and now people are beginning to understand um, that certain sites need to be planted a different way, treated differently. But we're a very young industry, so a lot of uh, 40 years ago we were thrilled at the thought of even being, a- being able to grow vinifera. So you can see what's happened in such a short period of time where we've moved away from a lot of the old hybrids um, and now the valley is predominantly probably 95% uh, vinifera. So all of that has happened in a very short period of time and now it's time for us to dial down what we do. At our own vineyard, we use what we call precision viticulture, which is where we take every single block and we look at it with a fresh set of eyes. So we'll dig pits, we'll find out what the soil structure is, and we'll analyze that, and then we'll determine the variety, the clone. We get away from rootstock because we want to be able to make our own plants. Um, Very challenging to import plants into Canada. We have a, a plant quarantine system, and uh, typically if the vines survive that, uh, a good third of them don't survive their first year in the ground. So we, at our winery, we like to use uh, 
own rooted plants. So we can take cuttings from our own vineyard and we propagate them in a, in a greenhouse over the winter and then plant them in, in the spring. Um, but uh, clone selection is really important. Obviously we're looking for early ripening varieties um, and we're looking for things that are going to be suitable to the soil that can withstand heat and can also withstand uh, a sharp end to the season as well. When it comes to picking decisions, there's really a few different camps. There's people that are looking for higher bricks, higher alcohol to support the style of wine that they're trying to make or the varieties that they're working with. And then there's there's a lot of sparkling wine made in the, in the valley. And so, of course, that's being um, harvested at much lower bricks levels. Uh, and then a lot of us are looking for lower alcohol wines. As I said earlier, when you're working with organic fruit, we find that we get phenolic ripeness at a much lower bricks level. And we like that because I, I believe there's a trend for people to embrace lower alcohol wines. And uh, it makes me happy when we can achieve that and get the same balance. Uh, we also have to be really careful about pH and TA. And uh, those are probably more of a concern for people uh, than bricks on its own would be. Yeah, we have a lot of natural juicy acidity in our wines. Uh, there's never an issue with that. Uh, and sort of balancing that out uh, with the pH is probably one of the biggest decisions that we make come picking. I think if you sort of dug into the diversity of styles that we offer in the north, I would say less is more. And that's the mantra that a lot of us subscribe to. Uh, we have such beautiful wines that are naturally growing with minimal interference from us that there's a collective feeling that we should make the wines as purely as we can. Simple, juicy, textured, just yummy. I mean, they're just, they're, they're, that's really a bad word. Is that in the wine vocabulary? Can you use yummy? But it's, there, there's just a, like a style across the, the north that's a very, we're looking for delicate, um, lively, fresh, bright wines. And we get that naturally, and the less you do, the more natural that is. So the wine I have in my glass is the Haywire Bub. 2017. The grape varieties are 50% Pinot Noir and 50% Chardonnay and we have planted some Pinot Meunier so vintages in the future will have a little bit of Pinot Meunier as well. We, we uh, get these, um, we harvest these grapes from two different sites. Uh, one is our Garnet Valley Ranch and then the other is Seacrest Mountain. Very different sites. Uh, Seacrest Mountain is in the south so it's got sandy loam and powdery limestone. And, of course, Garnet Valley is in the middle of volcano land. So varied soils, big boulders, gravel. Really interesting the change between the two sites. It's very incredible. Uh, the winemaking, this wine starts out life... Um, first of all, it's... Uh, really low bricks level when we when we harvest it and it goes into a concrete tank and it is fermented with uh, native yeast in, uh, that's found in our cellar. Uh, we have our own special yeast at Oak Mountain Crush Pad. We've been doing research with the university. They call it OCP 41 and uh, it is a, a yeast strain that they've never seen before. So they're working diligently to find the parents, siblings, cousins of uh, OCP-41 so they can identify its origins. Uh, this then goes into bottle, and it's usually left in the bottle for over two years. And then it is uh, disgorged, and usually we don't add a dosage. So we just top it up with more of the base wine and, uh, and leave it at that. Uh, the wine is, again, it's got some nice yeasty notes to it, um, but it's also 
got has those lively sort of juicy textured tones to it. Um, somebody described it earlier as uh, looking into a river and seeing many different layers to to get to the bottom. I thought, oh, that's a lovely way of saying it. Um, food pairings, oh my goodness, uh, oysters, cheese, soft cheese, a patio or a deck, <laughs> sunshine, <laughs> yeah, summer. Uh, it's it's a beautiful wine. We love making sparkling wine. We do an excellent job of sparkling wine in the Okanagan, and uh, more and more people are embracing sparkling wine as an everyday drink in our territory, not just a special occasion wine. And we're I think we'll, we'll see more and more producers getting into it in a big way. The next wine that we're going to try is the Haywire Gamay. 2019. These grapes came from our Seacrest Mountain vineyard in the south and it is, um, the alcohol is uh, 12%. The vineyard, as I said earlier, is sandy loam with limestone and uh, very difficult to stir up a, a boulder or a rock of any size whatsoever. Makes for easy farming. Uh, good, good drainage too. Uh, but you have to really dial in your irrigation program uh, uh, because there is not a lot of uh, moisture retention in the soil there. This was uh, harvested, destemmed, and then started out life in an open top fermenter. Uh, after about three weeks, it gets uh, it has punch downs two or three times a day. And then it gets uh, put into a basket press and pressed off, and then it goes into a concrete tank. So we're probably one of the few producers in the valley that don't use oak in our gamay. Uh, it's got all of those delicious sort of berry tones. It's just a, a beautiful clear wine. It hasn't been filtered, but it's been racked. Um, and it's mm. again there's some sort of lemony juicy notes to it I think if there was one word that I would use to describe this wine it's texture like it has ex um, it just has that sort of textured feeling and it carries through from, uh, it's got a nice mid palate to it as well, which a lot of the wines were lacking that, which was uh, why we, we spend a lot of time with the wines in concrete. And then we, rather than aging them in oak, we uh, bottle them after they've been in concrete for about 11 months. And we leave them to age in the bottle for about a year. So it's very rounded, and again, it's very integrated, I guess would be a word that I would use. Um, food pairing? Oh, my goodness. Anything? <laughs> uh, chicken, you know, pastas. Very, very versatile. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm excited to see more and more people uh, planting gamay. And there's a huge demand for it. Um, and it's exciting to uh, sell the wine with a Gamay on the label, especially in this market. I have personally been working in the UK market since the early 90s uh, with Wines of Canada. I've always loved this market because this is where you can see what the rest of the world is doing. I have tell my fellow winemakers that you have to come out and... You can't just stay in, we can't just stay in our own comfortable pond. Uh, we have to shake it up by coming out here and finding out what our true competition is because our competition isn't one another, it's the rest of the world. The UK has everything here. And uh, I love coming here and seeing trends that are forming and then ultimately hit Western Canada about three or four years later. <laughs> <laughs> but it gives you a heads up into the direction where uh, consumers are going. And uh, it's a very important market to be in. 
we are represented by Graft. Um, formerly, they were Red Squirrel, and we were part of the transition from Red Squirrel to Graft. They're a wonderful group of people. Um, and I love getting pictures or little video clips of somebody in a nightclub in Manchester, and there's my wine on the bar behind, or... You know, there's Carol's Wine Bar in Covent Garden, tent cases. I, I just love going to places like that and finding my uh, my wines. And I love being here in the market and having people come up and say, oh, I, I live in, uh, uh, you know, I live in this little tiny town in the south, and we have your wines on the list. We have it by the glass. It's very rewarding. And uh, I, I believe that uh, it's it's great. It's a good part of my education. In addition to coming to Canada House, we typically will go to RAW, and, and London's uh, wa- RAW Wine Festival. And uh, it's for me, that's a really great place for our winemaker to come and find out what other people are doing. And you see the evolution of, for example, the natural wine category and how it was definitely the Wild West uh, seven or eight years ago. And now people are beginning to di- dial in their techniques and they're actually understanding that uh, a little bit of winemaking goes a long way. You don't have to overdo it. But I've seen a huge shift in the natural wine category and the quality of the wines, too, uh, vastly improved. And so all of that learning has been uh, imported into our own practices at the winery. And it's from coming to this market where I've discovered all of the, the next phases of what we're going to be doing as an industry. Amazing overview there from Christine as we start to build a picture of the different growing conditions in the north and south. Here in the north, bringing you more volcanic activity and once again, the diversity of sites and microclimates, especially important given the intensity of the growing season. This isn't my first time trying Christine's wines and I still really love them. The non-dosage sparkling bub had such refreshing acidity. I actually thought it was ice cold when it was actually at room temperature. The non-oaked gamay was such an approachable and interesting wine which really seemed to bottle the regional character Christine spoke about. And I for one would love to see more gamay coming out of the Okanagan. Moving on, the next winery guest brings us our first visit of this series to the terroir of the Naramata Bench. My name is Tony Holler. I'm the owner of Poplar Grove Winery. Uh, Poplar Grove Winery is a family-run business. My wife and my four sons all work in the business, and um, we're an estate winery. We have about 140 acres of land. Um, my background, though, is quite different. I'm not a winemaker. I'm, I'm not a sommelier. I'm a wine drinker. I have a 5,000 bottle wine cellar from all over the world, and so my background is wine drinking rather than anything else. Um, we're located on what's called the Naramata Bench. The Naramata Bench, or one of the benches in the Okanagan, that were left behind when a huge ice bridge collapsed south of us and washed out the whole center of the valley. And now there's a massive lake. There was a massive lake, obviously, before, but now there's still a massive lake, but it's about 100, 200 feet below. And so when that ice bridge collapsed it took all the lake bottom with it and so a lot of our soil is now in Washington State and Oregon (laughs) when that the ice dam collapsed that's what happened um the the Naramata bench is interesting it because it's in between the North Okanagan and the South Okanagan um so why is there such a big difference in such a small area well two things change In terms of Naramata, you have this massive body of water which cools the area in the summer and heats the uh, area in the winter. And so, you know, it's a milder climate than, let's say, Asuyas, where you can get uh, temperatures in the mid-40s during the peak of the summer. Um, And then, of course, if you go to the North Okanagan, it's cooler and wetter and all those sorts of things. And then also because of this massive flood, the soil types vary a lot. So on the benches, it's clay, silty soil, right? And in Asuyas, where we grow all our big reds, it's gravel and sand. 
and it's just the nature of how that valley was washed out. Um, in terms of rain, we're a true desert, less than eight inches of rainfall a year. And it's drier in Osuyas than it is in Naramata. And then, of course, it's wetter in the North Okanagan. And so that really changes the type of grapes you grow. So in the hot South Okanagan, we have about 50 acres, and we grow all the big reds there. Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc. We grow um, Syrah, Petit Verdot, on the whites of Yonier, and some Chardonnay in, in South. On average, the temperature is somewhere between three and five degrees hotter during the summer. So then you have Naramata Bench, where it's milder. We have about 100 acres uh, of fruit there. And so we're growing varietals like Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, and on the reds, we're growing Merlot and Malbec because Merlot and Malbec, we've learned, don't like the heat. That's, you know, they just don't like the type of heat we get in the Now, we always refer to ourselves as a cool climate region. Why is that? It's because we get a very brief, short summer where it gets hot. There's no question it gets hot. We start as a cool spring, early summer cool. Then we get this brief period of time. By sort of mid-August, our temperatures start dropping, right? And so in September and October, just before harvest, you know, the temperatures are typically in the low 20s, right? So the, the, our summer is basically over. But there's some huge advantages to that. And that's when you look at our grapes and you taste the wines, they have this beautiful acidity. Why? Because it cools down and the acid stays in the grapes until harvest. So it's... It's, it's super interesting. Um, our wines are not available in the UK market, okay? We do not have a distributor here. We would love to have a distributor here, and one day we, we will. Now, you know, the problem for a lot of wineries, including us, we're, we're one of the biggest of the small wineries, so we do about 40,000 cases a year. But we sell all our wine locally, every year so you know that's a problem right it's it's a problem now um you know we we enter our wines in the the london international uh wine competition and decanter each year and our wines have done very well and so one of the things that you know i think that we as a company have have gained a lot of cre credibility from these competitions that we're in so you know that in part that's why i'm in london right because our credibility is important you know, it's, it's, it's always interesting. In Canada, your credibility comes from international. So if somebody in London says your wines are really good, that means a lot more than if somebody in uh, Canada says your wines are good, right? So, so it's a credibility thing. So um, in terms of the Naramata Bench, it's a long, skinny stretch of land. It's about 15 kilometers long. But literally, you know, it's at the most half a kilometer wide. It's a very, so there's not a lot of vineyards, to be perfectly honest. So most of our vineyards are actually at the entrance, at the south part of Naramata Bench. And so um, I think I mentioned that we grow Merlot, uh, Malbec, Chardonnay, Pin Pinot Gris is a big product for us. Uh, and, and, and we just planted 15 acres of Pinot Noir, right? So, so, and... Um, and, and, and again, the Naramata Bench is interesting in terms of the, its soil type because on the uh, lower side of Nor Naramata Road is the old lake bed. And so it's, it's clay loam silt, the soil. On the upper part of it, it's more uh, rock and gravel. And so, it, you know, there's quite a separation between the upper part, the, you know, the higher elevation Naramata Bench, and then the lower part, which was the old lake bed. You have to look at the microclimate of that site. You can't assume that all these sites are the same, which, which brings us to the wine that we're tasting now, which is Cabernet Franc. Now, a lot of people would say, Cabernet Franc, why the hell are you growing it on the Naramata bench? That's really a white wine, Merlot, Malbec region, Pinot Noir. And we have a specific site that's a heat sink on the Naramata bench. 
it slopes down to the lake in a southwest slope. So it gets all the sun, winter, summer, it get, it, it's just a hotter place. Now, it, um, we chose it because our viticulturists went, this is a perfect site and you're going to get a more elegant Cabernet Franc than you would get in your vineyards in Asuias. So we went ahead and planted it, and it turned out that was exactly the case. It's, it, it, it's a very elegant, softer Cabernet Franc, easy to drink, great with all sorts of different foods. Um, not that our Cabernet Franc from Asuias isn't a great wine, but it's different. It's more muscular. Um, so smelling this Munson Mountain Cabernet Franc, the first thing, you know, is has a very different nose than Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon. You get a real floral note on uh, on on the nose, and um, you know, even on the nose, it has an elegance. And and when you taste it, you even taste it, it, it. You actually get even more of that sort of floral note on your palate. What we strive for in this wine is a nice acidic backbone. Okay fruit forward and then we want that that refreshing mouthfeel when you when you drink this wine so we want you know a full palate but we also want it to be refreshing not heavy on your palate and that's why this wine with food it's dynamite you know just just perfect so this is a 217 vintage and that was a year when it wasn't particularly hot but it wasn't cold either so kind of what i would say a regular um, moderate uh, summer, right? Because we get, we tend to get cold, warm, or hot summers, and and that affects the fruit in a dramatic way. But this particular vintage was one of those beautiful, mild summers. We had the right amount of sun. You know, everything was almost perfect in, in this vintage. In terms of vintage variation, the one thing we have is this large body of water, Okanagan Lake, 120 miles long. You know four to six kilometers wide, 800 feet deep. So it's a massive sink. And what it does, it tempers the summer temperatures. So we tend to not get the same variability you might get in a Suez, where there's a small body of water that really doesn't influence the climate. Or the North Okanagan, where, you know, really the North has more effect on the climate than the lake does. So we're in that sort of beautiful area where the lake actually does do a fantastic job of tempering the climate. Fascinating insight there from Tony into the Naramata bench, covering its patchwork quilt of microclimates and really getting into the nuances its growing sides bring to the wines. Case in point, their super elegant Cab Franc, the second outstanding Cab Franc that we've already tasted in this series. Next, we head to the most northerly of the wineries covered in this series, discussing the influences this brings to the area and to the wines. My name is Angela Lyons, and I'm with Quailsgate Winery. Uh, the location of our winery is in the northern area of the Okanagan Valley, uh, which is in the interior of BC, Canada. Uh, so the northern area of the Okanagan Valley is generally a cooler climate versus the south, and uh, because of the climate and because of the, the site where we're located, we're really focused on Burgundian varietals, and we've been pursuing uh, making the best possible Pinot Noir and Chardonnay uh, for, for actually over three decades now. Uh, the land was originally purchased in 1956 uh, by the patriarch of the family, Richard Stewart, and at the time, you know, they looked at uh, the land uh, potentially for orchards, but ended up settling on vineyards. Uh, he, so the... Um, the, the land was really a vineyard site growing for other wineries in the early stages, but it was in 1989 that Ben, the son of, of uh, Richard and Rosemary Stewart, decided to open Quailsgate Winery. Uh, so 33 years old now, uh, VQA, which is uh, the quality designation for a number of wines in Canada, um, started actually a year after our winery started. It was really the start of quality winemaking, replanting to vinifera. So we do have some vineyards that go back as, as, they're as old as 1959. Uh, that's the Marichal Foch, some of those varieties which we still have and are cult favorites locally today, but uh, really the, the Dijon clones that Ben Stewart brought over 
uh, in the early 90s. That was really uh, the, the, the shift in, in winemaking. And I think that it's really interesting. We actually have uh, a number of different uh, Pinot Noirs uh, and Chardonnays that we're making, but the, the having 33 years of, of history um, in making these wines, we actually um, have a little bit more knowledge now, understanding site selection, different areas and blocks of the vineyards. And so we continue to keep everything separate when we ferment and and uh, and and are always looking at pursuing you know better and better uh, styles and and ensuring that we are bottling the best possible wine uh, for for people to enjoy. If you were arriving into the Okanagan Valley, you would likely fly into Kelowna uh, or drive into Kelowna. It's the largest city uh, in the valley, and we're located specifically in West Kelowna, so on the west side of the lake, and uh, specifically on an area that is called the Boucherie Bench. Uh, it's not an officially recognized area, but the road Boucherie runs right through our vineyard. We kind of divide the estate into the upper and lower Boucherie block. Uh, the thing that's really interesting about the site um, is that we are on the foot of a extinct volcano, Mount Boucherie, and at the uh, lower end of the vineyards is um, the lake. And so we have these gently sloped uh, rolling vineyards that are, um, are south-facing, uh, the other thing that, that's really quite important is if you looked at a map of Okanagan Lake, there's this one point uh, just uh, by Kelowna where it starts to turn and it dog legs over to the west and then it goes uh, south again. And so our vineyard is situated in these south-facing slopes that, that um, uh, happen just in that west Kelowna area. So we get optimal sunshine for great ripeness uh, from uh, the early morning hours uh, right into late afternoon. On the Boucherie uh, site, we have our upper and lower uh, vineyards, and the soil actually changes quite a bit. So because of the extinct volcano at the top, the very um, upper areas of the vineyard, there's some volcanic rock, uh, but the area was also influenced by uh, glaciers, and, and so we get a lot of glacial till midway through the vineyard, and then as you get closer down to the lake, the soils are quite silty and sandy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, as you can imagine, on a 160-acre estate, uh, with all these different blocks and different soil types, we have the opportunity to uh, plant different varieties and different clones. And, and the, this is, again, this is the spirit of, of innovation and experimentation that exists uh, at the estate to give us the opportunity to uh, continue to refine um, our winemaking techniques. One of the things that I find you discover when tasting wines from the Okanagan Valley is that you do get this fruit ripeness. Uh, people uh, sometimes think of Canadian wine as cool, uh, but actually this is quite a warm valley. And, uh, you know, but we have a great diurnal shift, so we have cool temperatures overnight. Um, and again, depending on the elevation of each individual vineyard site, uh, we have um, this cool uh, evening temperatures overnight, so it preserves the acidity, uh, which really leads to great structure in our wines. And so it's got this, this fruit uh, forwardness of the New World um, style, but yet we have this elegance and structure and finesse of, a, of some of the Old World wines. And so we have this, we're really carving out this unique style that is, is not, uh, it's our own unique style. It's Okanagan wines. And, you know, and we're young and we're, you know, we're, we're just over three decades, uh, but we're, we're really proud of what we're creating now. And we love to bring these wines to the world and see what people think of them. It's instructive as well for us to see how the wines uh, compare, what pe how people react to the wines. Uh, we're here in the UK. We have an importer, Berkman, um, and they've been uh, lovely to work with uh, in helping educate us into the uh, world of export. Uh, we bring our Chardonnay and Pinot Noir uh, to the UK market. Uh, we have specifically um, in the market right now our estate Chardonnay, our uh, family reserve Chardonnay, um, our estate Pinot, and our reserve Pinot. Uh, we've also brought Riesling in. So we have a number of wines here, very small quantities. And, um, you know, people are just discovering wines from Canada. And it's such a big country that really it's more about discovering wines from the Okanagan Valley. And then, you know, once you start to, to figure out what that style is, then, then you can kind of understand uh, the, the, the geography of Canada and what the wines will deliver in the glass. The wine that I've selected to taste with you today is the Sturt Family Reserve Chardonnay from the 2019 vintage. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're really focused on Chardonnay as a great variety uh, in this region. Uh, this wine is 100% uh, is Chardonnay. It comes entirely from our estate vineyard in the upper blocks of the Boucherie Bench. Uh, we tend to pick this wine a little bit more riper style uh, than our estate Chardonnay and 
Uh, we, we barrel ferment it, 100% barrel ferment uh, in light to medium toast oak and a lot of batonnage. So you really get a rich style. Uh, but it doesn't, it's, it's not, um, you know, with the, with the acidity in this wine, it stays fresh. And, you know, you might get into those marzipan kind of flavors, um, and the richness of it. But it's still, um, it's still it, it, it carries through beautifully in the end. One other thing I wanted to mention is that the Okanagan Valley has recently embarked on a, a certification program for sustainability. And it's been really important to us as a, as a winery. We're a family business, and we're now in the third generation, looking ahead to the fourth generation. And so it's so important to us that we are giving back more to the land that we take out. Um, we were the sixth winery in, in BC to get our, our certification for sustainability, so we're very proud of that. And uh, we are continuing down that path uh, to now get our certification in the winery. At Quailsgate, we also have a restaurant on site. Uh, it was originally a bistro, but we found that it uh, wasn't... Uh, we, you know, we talked a lot about food pairings all the time, but it was really important that we were discovering and experimenting and, and, uh, and doing the pairings ourselves. So uh, the family opened up a restaurant, Old Vines, uh, that's at the property. Please come and visit. It's a spectacular view. <laughs> Uh, uh, but on the, the menu, actually, uh, right now, we uh, are featuring our Stuart Family Reserve Chardonnay with pan-seared halibut. Uh, we often pair it with mussels when we have a, a, with a Chardonnay uh, sauce uh, or broth. Uh, and, and finally, we also love to pair this wine with creamy pasta dishes. The richness in the, in the wine uh, really beautifully complements uh, the richness of the, the sauces. Such an interesting Chardonnay that has all of the complexity you might expect from a barrel ferment with batonnage. Really alluring and quite opulent on the nose, but still with that trademark freshness on the palate, making it incredibly drinkable. In our final stop on the North Okanagan tour, we return to the Naramata bench to explore a Pinot Noir-focused estate. I'm Doug Barsley. Uh, I'm one of the owners of Foxtrot Winery and, uh, on the Naramata bench, uh, and we're a boutique winery specializing primarily in uh, Pinot Noir. I came to this uh, really with a background in Burgundy. Uh, that was my love for many years. Uh, I've written with uh, Alan Meadows a, a book on Burgundy vintages uh, from 1845, and so... Um, Really, when I came to the Okanagan Valley uh, in first time in, in 2017, looking for some property, uh, and the hope has been to try to bring a, a somewhat Burgundian sensibility um, <clears throat> to uh, the wines. This, this has, has seemed, uh, from the beginning, uh, my first experience with Foxtrot, actually, was... Uh, I was blinded on it in 2011 by a great Burgundy collector uh, in Vancouver, and I, I thought it must be a Burgundy. I couldn't figure out where it could be from in Burgundy, but it, it fit with the other great wines, and, and I, was, I was stunned by, by the quality and, and by its ability to express a sense of place, uh, and so... Uh, when some years later uh, I had an opportunity uh, to buy, first to buy and some property next to next door to Foxtrot, uh, and then uh, we had asked them to make the wine. They said, "Well, uh, time has come to sell the winery. Are you interested in buying it?" And uh, uh, long story short, we did. Uh, the winery itself. Um, the, the vineyard uh, is one of the earlier uh, plantings of Pinot Noir from about 1996, um, and uh, the wine was made um, for many for for the first uh, eight years or so. Uh, the wine was the grapes were sold off, uh, but Foxtrot started making its own wine in 2004. Uh, became really uh, an iconic wine uh, in British Columbia. So we were uh, thrilled to be able to, to take it over and, and to try to continue uh, and build on that legacy. Um, essentially, uh, as I mentioned, we're 
uh, in the Naramata Bench, which is about midway in the valley. It's it's the sweet spot, I think, for Pinot Noir. Um, our, we're located uh, about uh, altitude of about 500 meters. Uh, the vineyards run towards the southwest, down the slope towards the southwest. Um, great uh, sighting airflow, long, long afternoons of sunshine in the summer. Uh, and a soil which changes from uh, more uh, gravel uh, at the top to uh, more towards loamy sand uh, as it gets closer to um, Naramata Road. Uh, and it makes for an interesting contrast. There's a fair amount of clay in the soil, an underlay of calcium carbonate, and it gives a real complexity, uh, I think, to the wine. We're, we're, uh, we <clears throat> currently uh, make about six different uh, ter- small batches of terroir-specific wines, and we really think that there are uh, extremely interesting terroirs in the valley and, and uh, hope to be part of uh, the, the group that's expressing uh, that. Um, it took Burgundy several hundred years yeah. to uh, define and express its terroirs. I hope it doesn't take the Okanagan quite so long, but it's a process. Yeah. Um, we're... Um, New to the UK market, this is the first year uh, that uh, I or anybody from the winery has has been at the Canada House tastings, and and we are uh, looking for representation. Uh, but uh, this is an interesting and terrific market, and and we hope to find a place here. Today we're tasting uh, our 2019 Foxtrot Estate. Uh, this comes from. Uh, <clears throat> grapes that were planted, uh, as I mentioned, uh, about 25 years ago. Uh, it's important to note that these are all um, what in the valley is called unrooted or ungrafted vines, and it's it's uh, one of the relatively small number of places in the world where where ungrafted pinot can still be grown successfully, uh, and and to me it it gives. Uh, an added complexity and density um, to the wines. Um, we uh, uh, I mentioned uh, the, the soil um, running from more uh, gravel and, and uh, um, <clears throat> glacial till uh, down to more loamy sand in the lower parts. And I think uh, this all helps add to uh, the, the depth and, and complexity of these wines. Um, we do uh, practice uh, organic farming, although we're not certified yet. Um, we expect in time we will be, but um, we, we think that's, that's important. Um, the... Uh, Wines are given a three-day cold soak, uh, and then uh, uh, we add about 30% of uh, whole cluster to these wines. Um, And uh, then after fermentation, um, they go into about 20, little over 20% um, new Francois Frere barrels with very light toast, and the remainder is, is neutral oak. Um, and they stay in barrel about 16 months uh, overall, and uh, we find that that timing seems to give an added depth and, and complexity to the wine. Um, and this is uh, the, the wines tend to be fairly deep, uh, a little brooding when they're young, but but they they last extremely well, uh, and. Um, there are um, complex fruit notes uh, in the nose. Um, I think you get a, a, a touch of anise. Uh, you also get a very distinctive uh, soil signature, I think, both on the nose and, and the palate uh, in this wine. And, and it's something that um, 
<clears throat> certainly uh, over time uh, I've, I've become very familiar with um, you know as as being quite distinctive and and um, wines that are that come from similar locations a mile or two away can often be uh, uh, very different um, and there's a I think there's great density in this wine um, the tannins uh, while still very present uh, are relatively supple uh, <clears throat> and will smooth out over time and there's there's a, a good acidic balance to this um, and it's a wine I think will last a very long time um, I I love this wine with uh, <clears throat> things like squab um, uh, <clears throat> pheasant uh, a- any sort of uh, um, game birds of course it's also terrific with lamb um, <laughs> I just had veal with morels the other night and I thought this would have gone beautifully with that such an incredible wine and lovely to revisit just what makes Pinot Noir such a great grape for expressing the unique characteristics of the Vignon site and in many ways the perfect way to end the series. Do be sure to check out below for details of all of the wines tasted in this episode as well as the details of the importer or whether they're seeking representation. Below that you can find details of Wine Growers British Columbia's contact details So make sure you check out their website and follow them on social media to keep informed on what is happening in this super interesting region. Today's episode brings this two-part series to a close. And all that's left for me to do is to say a huge thank you to all of the winemakers who appeared. It was so incredible meeting you and getting your insight into the region. And I hope to be able to visit some of you in the near future. I'd also like to extend a huge thank you to Wine Growers British Columbia for sponsoring the series and to say a huge thank you to Laura Kitmer for all of your help in putting this together and your practical help on the day organizing interviews and covering wine stations. And of course, while you're here, I'd love to have you following along with me on social media where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook, at Wine Podcast on Twitter, and hello at interpretingwine.com. See you next time.